and we bring to you a new season of the Knowledge Show powered by Knowledgecape. My name is Ahmed Zaman and I will be the moderator for season two of this series as well. For everyone who's tuned in for the first time to the Knowledge Show, this initiative brings the leaders from different walks of life across the globe to talk on subjects related to business, talent, transformation, and life in general. The discussion in today's episode will be around the topic of skill-based organizations. And without further ado, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you to our guests. Our special guest for today's show is Sujata Das. Sujata is the Global Head of Learning and Organizational Development at Tavant. She is a versatile thought leader, a trusted advisor and partner in organizational learning, quality and process improvement, and knowledge management functions with 30 plus years of track record of successful strategic and tactical leadership within the IT, ITS and finance industry. 12 years into process quality, knowledge management and implementing people capability models added to her adeptness in supporting leaders, harnessing knowledge and information as business assets, helping improve effectiveness and efficiency through cross-boundary collaboration and partnering. Thank you so much, Sujata, for joining this show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Along with Sujata, we have with us the poster boy of experiential learning, Rajiv Jairaman. Rajiv Jairaman is the founder and CEO at Nowscape. Under his leadership, Nowscape has delivered incredible business outcomes for 370 plus leading organizations across 25 countries and has won numerous industry awards. A TEDx speaker, Rajiv has keen interest in psychology of learning, design, and technology. He is the author of Clearing the Digital Blur, a definitive guide to helping organizations and leaders transform at the speed of digital. Thank you so much, Rajiv, for joining us once again. Yeah, always a pleasure being part of the show. Thanks for having me, Amar. Thank you, Rajiv. So as is customary with the knowledge show, before we move to the more serious discussions, we will have a fun segment where we will play a rapid fire round with both Sujata and Rajiv. We'll begin with you, Sujata, uh, <laughs> since you are our special guest. So it is a would you rather segment. You will have two options and it will help our viewers to sort of know about your personality and preferences. And those things, yeah. So yes, we will begin with the first uh, question here. Would you rather lose your memory for a day or your phone for a week? A phone for a week. Oh, why is that? <laughs> it's better to be a little away because I have this tendency of playing games if not any calls. And uh, sometimes it, it's better to you know keep it away and reflect much more but on what you've done, what you can do. Ah, uh, that's wonderful. Okay, the next one. Would you rather be the best trainer or the best learner? Best learner? Because I guess even when you're trying to train somebody, there is an element that you're learning from the different audience which is there. And uh, when you're trying to learn yourself, that brings in a lot of humility, openness, and you are open to different ideas. And I think I always believe in becoming a learner. Wonderful. Uh, we move to the next question. Would you rather have to lay off good talent due to financial crisis or hire undeserving people due to talent crisis? Uh, as long as the attitude is good, I would rather hire people who may be willing to learn and then grow. That's one part of it. Uh, layoff is obviously not something which anyone would want to do <laughs> unless it is mandated. Right. Very nice, very nice. Uh, second last question for you, Sujata. Would you rather never have to worry about money or health? Never have to worry about health because money will anyway come and go. It is not a statutory thing, but health is something one needs to keep. Nice. Okay, last one for you, Sujata. Would you rather be surrounded by the best people or be supported by the best technologies? Best people. Technology again is changing. I can't say the same thing. Technology will remain today or tomorrow. You have to probably learn better. But best people are always there with you who will support you throughout. So I guess that's the answer. 
Oh my God. Wonderful responses to all questions. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely that's question. A tough, that's a tough <laughs> act to follow, Sujata. You, this is very unfair. <laughs> Thank you. We will come to you now, Raji. Uh, at this moment, uh, would you rather invest in Google or Chat GPT? Uh, Chat GPT. Uh, and the reason is, uh, you know, it, it is uh, still not known what the future is and how Chat GPT will evolve uh, in the future. But as an investor, just looking at the momentum behind the technology and how it could end up disrupting Google. And in fact, I've heard this at Nolske where they are saying, if I want to do some research, I go to chat GPT and not Google. So it's potentially going to uh, disrupt Google at some point in time. So I will invest in chat GPT. Wow. Google has a lot of ground to cover here. Great. Uh, thanks, Rajiv. Uh, your next question is, would you rather attend the lecture of your favorite professor or the concert of your favorite singer? Okay, uh, so that's a tough one because I have a love for learning and a love for music as well. Uh, but I think in this case, I'll go or uh, attend the lecture. Um, right. And, and uh, in the in the last two to two and a half years, I, I think the passion for learning and more importantly, uh, the right kind of teacher uh, who can, you know, unlock your thought process. I think I've become a firm believer in that. So I think I'm going to pick that. Very nice. Uh, your next question, Rajiv, is would you rather have a life without arguments or without appreciation? Uh, I think we need a mix of both. So it's going to be a, a tough one. So I think I'll take appreciation, um, right, for job well done. I think emotionally it feels good. Um, arguments, um, as long as they are healthy, um, right, constructive, I'll, I'll take a bit of that as well, but I think I'll move more towards appreciation. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, second last question for you, Rajiv. Um, would you rather never feel the need to sleep or never feel the need to eat? <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, off late, I've been into uh, intermittent fasting and I do fasting quite regularly. So I, I can see myself sort of weaning away from this need to eat. Of course, I need to eat uh, to survive, but I think I'll, I'll take uh, sleep uh, over eating. Oh. I put this question specifically because uh, you have a passion for doing a lot of different things, which means you might want more time in a day and eating because you've always focused on fitness as well. So. Yeah. yeah okay <laughs> yeah, good good uh, response in that uh, the last question for you rajiv and perhaps in, in this segment also uh, would you rather be a superman or own a genie you already own a genie in a way right <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's an interesting one so um sujata for context is a platform we've developed called genie uh, so that allows us to create new simulations and all of that so I think at the moment, I, I think uh, uh, owning a genie and making it successful is probably what I'll uh, what I'll go for. Perfect, perfect. I think uh, uh, that was a great segment. Too much fun, right? Uh, and and that's the idea for for this segment before we jump to the more uh, serious discussions. So, like like I said, we will now move to uh, the topical discussion for today. And uh, to start off with, uh, I'll I'll go with Sujata first. So, Sujata, the thing is that people are still catching up with the concept of uh, skill-based organizations, right? So, uh, to, to set a context for all our viewers, uh, can, can you explain what this actually entails, the entire skill-based organization thing, and, and how it actually differs from the traditional uh, hierarchical uh, structure? Okay, let me start with the technical hierarchical structure, which used to be there, which people are more aware of. Uh, that relies mostly on different levels of authority. There's a chain of command, for example, in connecting to different levels or the different stakeholders that you may have. A lot of formal and uh, the flow is top down. Uh, sometimes it, decisions also take a lot of time because of all of this. Whereas skill based organizations is more agile, and I think this has been more prevalent because agility is something which every organization and the customer looks for. We want things as fast as possible and therefore, and to the changing environment, it requires to be that nimble and agile. So it has a lot of people-centric approach. That's what I probably see. And people uh, are valued more for their skill rather than just a position that they may have or a level they may have in an organization. 
and in this type of uh, operating model you find uh, it's easier to align people to the task or the applications based on the skills rather than a particular um, you know level or a position for that matter there's a lot more emphasis on the capabilities and interests of people also that comes in and that focus actually helps in uh, you know focusing on skill sets instead of job experience i would say can also help organizations uh, become very uh, optimizing for their talent pool that they have that's where i feel uh, it's more flatter and team based structures are there the most beautiful thing about this approach would be as i said the human centric uh, future by understanding what the workforce is bringing on to the table and where can you proactively equip them to succeed for tomorrow or in short any organization uh, i would say focusing on the skill based structure is able to respond to those changes which is uh, happening on a day to day basis more efficiently uh, helping to boost the agility adaptability and nimbleness this is what i feel from my point of view thank you uh, rajiv how, how would you define uh, uh, skill based organizations to uh, for for the better understanding of our viewers okay firstly i, I think the um, explanation offered by, by sujatha is spot on i just want to add uh, a few data points um, from the deloitte survey and they have done a lot of work on uh, skill based organizations some of these data points are telling uh, right 63% of executives say the work in their organizations is currently being performed in teams or projects outside of people's core job descriptions simply put 63% of the job that you would like to get done is being done in teams or projects out side of people's core job descriptions right so in which case we don't know if the right people are doing the right jobs uh, their productivity their performance and in in a way fairness as well uh, right the person is hired for something but uh, is doing something else completely right um, and that's a difference that we see in some more data points 81% uh, executives say work is increasingly getting performed across functional boundaries so what does it tell you you don't have um, you know control over your own deliverables you're dependent on so many other teams and you can't control the kind of talent that's available in other teams right so that's a challenge uh, 36% say work is increasingly being performed by workers outside of the organization who do not have defined jobs in the organization at all think about gig economy right many industries tend to depend on gig economies where uh, 36% uh, of the jobs are done by external people it could be partners it could be vendors it could be uh, individuals and in this case as well you don't have complete control over who's getting uh, stuff done and finally fewer than half that is 42% of respondents say that their organization's jd job description actually captures the the work to be done so that's alarming uh, in a way because the entire uh, business engine we know of today where employees are hired uh, they get hired based on a certain job description if that job description to begin with does not capture what is a job to be done the problem starts right there and then it becomes difficult after that right because after that you're playing a catch up game because you don't have the right people to begin with and then you need to train them and then on top of this changes upon us and constant changes uh, and i think this is the reason why organizations now feel the need to move away from a job based model to a skill based model because end of the day if you have a job to be done a business outcome to be achieved it is a skill that is um, that's uh, helping you achieve that uh, right instead of something static called a job which nobody is able to put uh, his or her hand around so that's essentially the reason why we are seeing the emergence of skill based organizations right and and very interesting point you mentioned that uh, change is upon us and everything is evolving day in day out right and that also means that the needs of the uh, organizations are also very dynamic they are changing every day perhaps right how do organizations actually ensure that the skills of its employees is aligned to this dynamic need that they might have uh, every, every day every week every month um, when we talk to clos in organizations they say this um 
that you know firstly the business cycle is shrinking you know 6 months 9 months new technologies are coming right sujata had this point as well earlier technologies keep rapidly changing and along with it the skills have to change as well but your talent pipeline doesn't is not very uh, is not very agile uh, right so and and in today's context you would know that there are four b's in talent management we speak of the four b's are build by borrow and bots bots meaning robots right um, so constantly leaders are evaluating uh, you know should i be building this new skill in the context of change how long does it take me to build that new skill or do i go out and uh, acquire that new skill uh, hire for that purpose or do i do the gig economy right um, i borrow those skills or is this something that i can automate away right so this is a decision that one needs to take on a continuous basis and i think there are economics involved here build versus buy there are, there's a certain uh, economic reality to that sometimes it may be wise to build it other times it might be uh, wise to go out and buy the talent from the external market now this model has been in existence for long but i think what is critical now is the cycle times are getting shorter and shorter so this evaluation of the four b's Uh, becomes an agile process at every point in time you're continuously asking that question of yourself so because of this reality uh, everything from talent acquisition to talent development to what skills have to be developed uh, to what extent will will the learning leaders be uh, in touch with business leaders right as as the business changes are we able to build new skills uh, right or uh, do this proactively seeing some change coming can we proactively build a few things which only means one thing for learning teams right uh, we cannot be silos anymore right we need to be integrated with business and become advisors to business in fact instead of taking um, sort of an order saying you know this program needs to be done can we become advisors to business saying in the next 12 to 18 months these are the skills that need to be built for achieving our business outcome so i think the the partnership with business has to uh, be established right up front awesome um, nice perspectives there uh, rajiv uh, sujata would you would you want to add anything to what rajiv said in any more i completely agree with what rajiv said the integration part and how you need to this, uh, partner with the business is most uh, important and that's what we've also been doing without which i don't think learning can really uh, support as a team we cannot support our associates to truly perform Uh, one aspect i would like to share is within savant uh, we very strongly go with the okrs so objective and key results uh, which truly help us to focus and have a clear focus in direction and this every quarter we have both commit as well as stretch goals so that really helps us both whether it is products or the projects that we deliver and in line with that the learning is also being developed in terms of the whether it's a program whether it is something on a reskilling or an upskilling or new things that are coming through all of this is tied based on what are the organization goals so one clear aspect that we see is uh, we have the organization goals uh, connected with the customer and then of course based on those needs we have the business goals coming in the team and the functional goals which are there and that gets drilled down to the associate so very easily a person is able to uh, look at their goals and say where are we adding value and that actually ties up the whole thing uh, in developing it is not easy as dadi said because of the changes and the pressure and understanding uh, like you rightly said about the job descriptions changing but i think it is moving away from just being specialist like you have a java professional now today we look at a full stack they need to understand end to end that is being appreciated by people and that's where the alignment truly really helps thanks ajata and and very interestingly you you mentioned about the business goals and how how that can be aligned right uh, uh, and and uh, most people would be interested to know how, the success rate of such kind of a model right so would you have any examples to share about any successful skill based projects or initiatives that you or your organization would have implemented uh, at tawant we've been following the agile methodology for quite some time because we've been both in our products as well as projects in products you definitely need to understand the changes in the environment the customer requirements what is it changing and we've been able to do that very well 
and we've encouraged our associates also to go ahead and uh, learn upcoming technologies which are there or uh, wherever we feel this is something which can add value to our products or the projects uh, based on the customer requirements because so we have a very good rapport with the customer there's a co-creation sometimes that happens so we understand what technologies they are planning to use and we encourage them to go ahead and learn and get certified into those so that industry based standards are also there we give them some of the projects internally to have hands-on and create the expertise now this has really helped us in multiple ways we've had a couple of projects which um, had to actually uh, these are conversion projects some of the customers moved away from azure to aws because they wanted to do that uh, similarly there was a conversion project from power bi to tableau that was another project very recently we did uh, there are also certain other projects or clients who have come back and added on because they wanted to uh, there are big data projects which probably required more additional uh, resources from you know they were using informatica etl for bringing in data from every source for example these things we were able to quickly pick up because our uh, people were skilled in those areas and this is where we started using those skill base so for us naturally we are looking at the skill based part rather than any specific job role or what is required and I, I feel this is helping because that nimbleness or agility in terms of the responses that we are able to give to the uh, customers are also very critical for us. I think those are, those are really uh, relevant examples uh, you shared, Sujata, uh, for the interest of our viewers. Uh, Rajiv, do you have any anecdotes or examples that probably support why, why skill-based organizations should do better than their uh, traditional models? Yeah, so a few examples that I uh, can think of uh, from the industry uh, to begin with, right, is there are organizations, uh, more so in uh, project-based organizations, uh, right, it could be advertising, for example, which, which uh, tend to go project to project, uh, right, or IT services, which are predominantly uh, done in a project-based fashion. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think, relatively easier to think in terms of um, skill-based organizations compared to, let's say, an R&D um, a driven company where uh, when you sp speak about skill-based organizations and uh, fast changing circumstances, sometimes, you know, I was talking to these um, uh, researchers and R&D folks um, just a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking about skill-based organizations. They were saying it takes them five to six years to mature a technology, right? And, and so um, even within that, uh, you know, you are now thinking in terms of uh, rapid iterations, right? Uh, you you don't go waterfall into six years, but you're constantly doing persevere pivot, uh, maybe at the end of every six months, every um, year. So even in, in longer term, uh, you know, projects, so to speak, right, uh, in an R&D context, one can really think in terms of skills. What, what does it take for me to go from milestone A to milestone B? Instead of taking a six-year view, can I take a year-long view and just think in terms of skills needed to go from point A to point B? Um, while different organizations are, are at different levels uh, when it comes to being skill-based, um, you know, based on whether it's services, whether it's uh, project-driven or it is product-driven and R&D-driven, you see a different uh, approach to this. But end of the day, uh, one rea underlying reality across all of this is business cycles are getting shorter. Even product development cycles, when you talk about R&D, um, uh, today those cycles are getting shorter as well. So I think this thought process is applicable across. And one thing I've seen companies do well uh, is they create an internal marketplace for talent. And if let's say uh, there is a platform internally where there are projects listed and then there are people on the other side who want to bid for it and, and they make their uh, skills um, available for the organization, uh, they somehow unlock and make this entire process more transparent. And going back to the silo point I was making earlier is many traditional organizations are siloed, right? If a team has, let's say 20 people, uh, that's a black box, right? Who are these 20 people? What sort of skills do they have? The rest of the organization probably doesn't know, uh, right? And so somewhere I think this uh, talent audit needs to be done, uh, right? Across the board, who is skilled in what? Uh, can that be visualized? And when, when a new opportunity shows up, are we able to assemble these people uh, for that new opportunity. I think those are some infrastructure changes that can happen inside companies. 
Uh, very interesting points there, Rajiv. Uh, we, we have spoken about one aspect of the entire skill-based organization, which is the organization part, business goals, and all of that. There's another aspect to it, which is an individual or an employee and their growth in this kind of a model, right? So how can organizations really handle uh, uh, the growth of individuals and employees to ensure that they are also growing in, in the entire ecosystem? Yeah, um, so there's an interesting one. Um, you know, when I wrote the book, uh, Clearing the Digital Blur, I was actually spending a lot of time on this uh, because B in blur is boundaryless organizations, right? Which means that um, internal silos that exist uh, within teams, that sort of blurs away. When that happens, uh, employees suddenly find themselves working a lot more with other stakeholders within the organization uh, that may, they may not have direct control over, um, right? So it's basically, how do you work in a network setup? And back to what Sujata was saying earlier, from the command and control kind of a top-down hierarchical model, now we have pivoted to more of a distributed networked model. And I think uh, a lot of us are not ready for that kind of new ways of working. We are still very comfortable with having a leader telling us what to do and it's very structured. And suddenly being thrown open in a network and saying, you go figure it out is a little bit of a challenge, right? So, and so what does it require? Uh, you know, what does the individual have to do? One, get comfortable with lack of boundaries. Uh, right. Um, in terms of uh, the teams that I will interact with, the, the stakeholders that I need to influence, uh, that's on the softer side. And if you're a leader, ability to work across both internally and externally, being um, proficient in that is, is critical. And in terms of, um, you know, technical skills or process skills, uh, I think the key element more than what is to be learned uh, it the, the focus is on the learner himself or herself. Do you have growth mindset? Do you have uh, learning agility? Those are some fundamental skills because what's on top will keep changing. The technical skill uh, skill will changing processes uh, will keep changing. But I think what we need to enable people with is uh, a set of these foundational skills like growth mindset. Don't get stuck in a box. You know, explore. Um, you know, also be a uh, being, uh, you know, be agile when it comes to learning. So I think if we can build that into people and create a learning culture, enable a culture of experimentation where people can learn through practice uh, on their work as well. I think these are uh, some elements that be done for individuals. Perfect. Uh, Sujata, what, what's your perspective on how, how organizations can handle their employees development in the entire process of adapting to a skill-based model? I think three critical terms that uh, Raji just mentioned, boundaryless, learning agility, and growth mindset. That, that is the fundamental uh, foundation, I guess, uh, to even build any skills. So I would probably say the way we are uh, attempting that is we try to look at or anticipate the areas where our organization is focusing based on the customer base that we have, the industries that we work with, and we help or at least create that awareness in people that these are some of the technologies which were in the projects may be coming in. You may want to, you know, hone your expertise and knowledge in that area. Second, we do provide a lot of uh, support for aspirations as well. There are people who want to change. Um, certain mindsets are good, like, uh, you know, people want to take up certain risk and try different areas. So we've had program, we have a program within uh, called Spring Within, wherein we encourage people to move from one area to any other area that they want to really take up. So there have been people who have moved from Java to Python, or for that matter, let's say from somebody from quality engineering, moving it to uh, Salesforce, uh, based on you know various options which are there. And I, I truly agree with Rajiv in saying, uh, like a talent marketplace, we uh, do open up our opportunities to people internally, trying to say these are things which are coming up. and based on their aspirations and their interests, we also support them in learning and picking up those areas as well. So that's how we try to help them. In addition to that, we are developing capability libraries. Uh, competencies, again, is something by the time you develop, the technology has changed. So what we are trying to do is we created three different levels for every technology, basic to intermediate, intermediate to advanced, advanced to expert. 
now basic to intermediate and uh, intermediate to advanced are mostly conceptual where they also have ep person hands on that's how we are trying to uh, provide the support to people it's a mix and match of blend where they do self study there is a cohort they can peer to peer learning is there they have subject matter experts aligned to them so uh, they can go back and ask any of the doubts that they are having and then we also provide them uh, infrastructure for doing the hands on this, so this is the learning part of it when it comes to the third bucket which is moving from advanced to expertise which is taking on complexity or different case studies or you know projects or problem statements are given to them which has a lot of complexity so they gain a lot more hands on and get a lot of confidence before they move on uh, to a project so that's how we are trying to create a, a capability library within the organization so i think these are few ways we are trying to address this particular issue uh, aspirations what is actually happening what are the new technologies we also have certain tech aware sessions on technologies we may not be working in but upcoming ones at least to give them the awareness of this is what uh, is there out there in the industry so we provide all that support to our uh, people to choose what they want and develop in their careers very very interesting uh, anecdotes again uh, sujata on on that uh, uh. question right uh, rajiv you mentioned uh, uh, several terms like uh, ecosystem network and marketplaces and all of that so so from that perspective how do you think organizations can manage probably uh, the cross functional collaboration and skill sharing within or perhaps even outside of the company for or facilitate their employees to get into uh, cross functional or, or in, in inter and intra organizational interactions okay that's a great question uh, right so this is a cultural question uh, right how open are teams um, when it comes to allowing their talent uh, the people within their team to work on something else uh, right so this is always a challenge because a leader in that team wants to uh, hold and hold uh, their people uh, right so that that's always a challenge so i think there is a cultural element so uh, one of the cultural pillars for being boundaryless is being open peering and sharing right and usually this is uh, talked about in the context of data right uh, so in an open organ boundaryless organization data sort of floats around seamlessly it's borderless uh, you use data to sort of uh, make insight sort of uh, things and and that's a challenge by itself right because the sales team doesn't want the marketing team to see how, how the numbers are going the production team doesn't want to see how much uh, a buffer they have got and all of that right so even with data it is an issue now think about people now in a uh, in a boundaryless organization the organizational structure has to be open enough like a marketplace uh, which idea we spoke about and then you have to allow for collaboration to happen across teams uh, right and and uh, this data point says 81% of the work is currently done across functional boundaries in which case you know collaboration is a must have if an organization cannot collaborate uh, they will be disrupted that's the 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 conclusion you can come to so openness collaboration and sharing of resources meaning that you know 20% of the time of this individual is free for something else right um, an aspirational project uh, you know building on what uh, sujata was mentioning or this could be uh, something that other team is lacking a skill set on and this person can go in and fill right so so openness peering and uh, sharing these three elements have to be built into an organizational cultural dna right this is not an individual this is not just a few teams but it has to be baked into the organizational culture itself very very interesting take there rajiv on uh, reflecting it and co correlating it with the culture of an organization right uh, so jata what what what's your take on that we are different lens uh, to look at and building upon what rajiv has just mentioned from a learning team also i always believe it's not just about giving an opportunity and somebody just picking up something but it's also about truly knowledge sharing there's a lot which is there as an experience that we gain when we try to implement certain aspects that we have learned so in our organization we have built that culture in the last 3 years very successfully we have several knowledge sharing initiatives that's happened and primarily because i sensed a gap when we were initially trying to look at the learning aspects like uh, rajiv said it's 
it may be intentional it may not be intentional also wherein uh, for example people are working in the same different a certain architecture or a technology but they are working in different verticals so we have practices and verticals within the organization so we have fintech we have manufacturing we have media and let's assume one particular technology is being worked in manufacturing naturally within that group they may be uh, you know occasions where they come together and they share but it's not shared on an org wide it was it wasn't being shared so we brought these different uh, knowledge sharing forums like knowledge r which talks about the domain uh, especially if i have learned something new i can come back and it's open to anybody to come and speak no hierarchy nothing anyone can come back and share what they have learned about a specific uh, technology or a domain or even some of the leadership concepts which are there then we have project hours where uh, the teams it could be a single person or a team who can come back and share how they have implemented a particular technology within the projects you know what has been the scope what has been the risk what has been the challenges how did they mitigate them so the entire way of implementation experience is being shared with people and this has really been successful because even though we are globally uh you know our organization is global and we have people in different uh, locations we also share these recordings uh, are posted as a repository so people can go back and refer if they miss out on a particular uh, session that is happening then we have knowledge hubs which actually uh, helps peer learning so there are a set of people who want to do uh, tomorrow aws certification for example and uh, they we give them this uh, entire cohort is created we give them the infrastructure the materials to prepare smes are their subject matter experts who align with them and support them so that's a knowledge hub and then finally even for hobbies we have one which is called knowledge club where they come back and they share about uh, different things which they have interested in somebody has shared on um yoga somebody has shared on you know collection of watches and so on and so forth so we don't restrict it to only work but it's also on to both so, and that also brings in a lot of people because somebody has a, a same type of a hobby also helps people to get into that trap or know the person and then slowly and steadily work also something that they share so that's one of the key things very recently we started something called art studio which was Uh, targeted all the architects across the organization so that they can come back and share on different architectures used and how they have implemented in the various projects so i think uh, this cross functional collaboration could be uh, across the entire organization per se or even target groups working in multiple business which truly helps to build on the knowledge that people and the experience people have gained through implementation I think it's a very good concept, and it should be there. Otherwise, moment, uh, you know, in today's changing world, is not possible because definitely people have different experiences. Bringing that diverse experience together makes a good power in delivering the best of outcomes. Is what I think. I found that very uh, insightful, Sujatha. Just to jump in there, I was just writing down a few things that you mentioned. Maybe there is a framework here that we can invent. Um, <laughs> so essentially what you're pointing out is there is a knowledge management element in all of this yes right that because is what we have knowledge, knowledge available across now how do we um, firstly get all of that knowledge in one place like a wikipedia of sorts right you know that's a knowledge uh, hub that you're talking about so uh, essentially that content plus the community you build around you know people who like yoga for example or people who like a particular technology so the content plus the community uh, the collaboration that um, that it leads to uh, builds capabilities for the organization different types of rapidly emerging capabilities that finally leads to commerce so this is the 5c framework that sujatha and i have just invented uh, <laughs> right content community collaboration leading to capabilities um then leading to commerce absolutely and and one of the key things i would also say is uh, we we branded our own function from learning and organizational development to uh, knowledge excellence primarily because ah. we were building up this uh, community of practice and all of that <laughs> interesting interesting 
so so the next time i am introducing the knowledge show i will probably have to add that not only do we discuss uh, topical trends but also we uh, build framework uh, live so live on the show in the session yeah. <laughs> that is one that's what topic. collaboration is for <laughs> that's right that, that's live example of that right this is amazing wonderful uh, wonderful so sujata you you mentioned and and you gave a great uh, deal of details on the implementation of the formalized way and also the casual way of probably knowledge sharing right but when we look at uh, uh, measuring the success or maybe pursuing a benchmark that probably is an indicator that this model is successful do we have anything like that for skill based uh, approach or a skill based organization how do you really uh, a gauge whether the uh, any any initiative or a program or the the overall model per se is successful okay so we do have health metrics like uh, you know people attending number of hours and all of that to just ensure that people are coming in or to bring back yeah. uh, you know the momentum which is there but uh, to look at the effectiveness as you say i think uh, we believe in the impact that is created be it for the individual be it for the team for the organization or for the customer all four angles are tried out especially in this so if i were to say that a particular project that uh, where we had the conversion if i were to take that particular example from aws to azure uh, the customer was moving from one cloud to the other whatever various reasons they may have because we were having these open sessions we will come back and attend to see okay i am working in assure what is new and or what is different in aws or those interests are there people come and speak about it or they come and hear those projects it was very easy for people to quickly pick it up and convert it within the limited period of time while working in the project they were not sitting on a bench or they were not free that way they took out at least 2 hours in a day to learn and understand the changes and then convert it the whole thing so i think the uh, key area i would say is the impact that we create that is what i would look at as a mission over here rajiv uh, uh, your perspective on that yeah i was just um, uh, thinking through this so back to what i was saying earlier uh, an organization would definitely have a build versus buy kind of an approach to talent Uh, so maybe there is some uh, real cost dollar attached to this right the the building budget versus the buying budget um so am i able to meet from a talent perspective um the build versus buy mix right and for that being a great skill based organization in today's context is critical right because otherwise you won't be able to build uh, talent uh, on demand so that is one second is uh, probably one can look at time to productivity um right for example a new opportunity comes up let's say in an it services kind of a context uh, maybe you know pfizer uh, says you know on metaverse i need 1000 people to work on this project um number one are we able to service something like that you know the quick turnaround kind of fashion which may be a measurement there could be opportunity loss right there was an opportunity on the table but we could not um you know cater to that uh, either that or the time to productivity uh so now that i have x number of people identified how quickly can i get them onboarded on this project so some of these are traditional metrics no doubt uh, but in the context of um, you know skill based organization some of these become accelerated now are you able to keep up with that i think is the key question if i may just add one more point here and uh, while raji was speaking i was remembering Uh, a lot of organizations and so do we have moved into the spot structure wherever it is possible sometimes you're working with the customers and uh, they are also co-partnering so therefore there's a lot more involvement from them but otherwise we find that as a pod structure this product oriented uh, model in the software development context if i were to say where people come from diverse uh, skills come together so that you have a project manager you have a devops person so there is a design develop test operate all of that coming together so that also helps in creating an efficiency while we are working so that measure can also be done where we can bring in the diverse group together yeah so just to add one more point that i've come across in the industry is um, let's say um internal reskilling right so for example job rotation uh, for, for example to what extent uh, can my existing employees fill a particular role 
um, right? And so that is also a function of upskilling and reskilling that you can do. Again, skill-based uh, upskilling, reskilling, how robust is that mechanism to promote this internal movement of uh, people? Awesome, awesome. So uh, uh, my next question is related to larger organizations. And while it might be, might be surprising, but a lot of these leading large organizations are uh, very much driven and led by uh, structures, right? And uh, they, they are still operating on, on a traditional model. So for, for such large organizations, which have a lot of teams and so many departments and so many projects going on, right? How challenging is it for them to really make that shift from a traditional model to say a, a skill-based uh, model within the organization? Uh, Rajiv, if you can uh, take that first. Yeah, so um, while in some uh, parts of the organization, let's say finance or um, supply chain, I, I'm just thinking aloud here, maybe you want to have some traditional structures to sort of govern, um, to have some compliance around it. So that, that structure uh, really helps a lot. Um, but in other areas where one needs to actually be very agile, uh, where uh, it's okay to take risks, uh, the, the, the whole... Uh, ideas fail fast, learn fast, uh, kind of a, um, a model. There, maybe the organization can um, sort of look at uh, self-managed teams, uh, right? Make it a little bit more agile. Still having the the hierarchical structure. At some point, all of these need to roll up uh, into a hierarchical structure. But to what extent can we decentralize this? Um, is I think an important element. Again, the the idea being, how can we move fast? Uh, right? Um, can the elephant dance is what uh, people uh, often ask of large organizations. Uh, I think the elephant can uh, dance if uh, the, the feet can move fast, uh, right? Or the trunk can move fast. The entire body need, need not move fast. Uh, so maybe, you know, some uh, parts of the organization, um, you know, it can be a lot more decentralized. And within um, the scope of those self-managed teams, um, you know, start looking at more skill-based way of the entire uh, employee life cycle from talent acquisition to development to promotion, all of this, uh, one can look at it from a skill lens instead of a traditional job lens. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Rajiv. Uh, Sujata, what, what's your take on, on that front? I think be it large or mid-sized or smaller organization, challenges will definitely be there. Um, as Rajiv said, it is something that people need to look at it from a different lens. And uh, so to, to me, I feel people need to change their mindset and uh, truly understand and practice, uh, quote unquote, I would say, continual and lifelong learning, which is something which is very much focused in today's time, especially in the environment and focusing on the skills. So two aspects I would highlight over here is one, uh, from a learner's perspective, definitely be open to learn, unlearn, and relearn because I may know something, but um, I think the best uh, example or the quote I can say from Marshall Goldsmith is the most relevant one here. What got you here will not get you there. In terms of what I would have seen as a success may not work in the same environment. So definitely people need to be open to uh, unlearn, uh, look at the different uh, ways which are there and relearn so that they would have multiple different approaches to the same solution that they are trying to do. The second part of it is uh, in terms of the stages of competence which is there, where we call as unconscious incompetence, which is more to do of ignorance. A lot of people, when we try to talk to them, they may not have heard about a certain aspect. Uh, so it's uh, it's important for the learning fraternity to make sure that those are brought in front of them so that at least they are aware such a thing is there and there is an opportunity over here. Uh, moving on to the next one is conscious incompetence or awareness. Once they know and at least they have probably uh, tried their hands at it, they know where they are lacking and they're able to build those skill sets. And then once they know the concept, the third uh, triggers on the conscious competence where uh, people are aware uh, in terms of learning, they can they can make a lot of mistakes, but it is that integral part which is creating and uh, the moment they know the concepts, how much are they practicing and that practice makes it into a perfect which moves on to the last stage of unconscious competence or mastery as it is called. So 
having these two are very important in terms of um, trying to make those changes so if people within an organization whatever levels they may be understand this concept i think like uh, rajiv said a milikan can dance it's the the way we take it through so that's what i feel over here a uh, great insights there uh, sujata uh, for my last question i would want both of your uh, quick take on this it, it is slightly an extension of the previous question uh, itself uh, what is the best way probably to start the transition towards becoming uh, a skill based organization rajiv a quick take um so i'm a big believer uh, in the minimum viable approach um, right so before any and that's the the heart of agile thinking in any case uh right so i think um when we are thinking about building a skill based organization identify that minimum viable team or a minimum viable process or product or project uh where you would like to implement this i think that's a starting point and then um my belief is also that um you know context uh can differ from industry to industry company to company there is a cultural element as well so it's not a one size fit all kind of a model so one needs to sort of learn uh, and improvise so uh, the other approach that i would recommend is a build measure learn right again coming from the lean startup approach so once you have um, identified the minimum viable project or the product where you would like to implement this uh, build measure and learn and make it iterative perfect so jata your take uh i do agree from the agile methodologies is where one way, because people understand when it's an agile methodology you know you pick up the most priority ones and you can iterate and then build on it so definitely implementing those methodologies in any area function will definitely help uh having a common language of skills across the organization uh, especially in application and development also when we are managing performance of people uh, truly help them to understand and appreciate the skill based development uh, talent marketplace as uh, rajiv was mentioning giving people those opportunities what is there so that they can also pick and choose and the moment people do it themselves there's a lot more engagement and productivity towards uh, doing something in the best manner possible from a learning perspective as i always mention learning and knowledge management or change are all part of these entire aspects so bringing the people together uh, especially in today's world of adaptive learning or social learning or giving them opportunities beyond just formal classroom session or uh, resources is something that i would definitely recommend uh, where there's a balance between that formal and informal Uh, so that people get to know and uh, both from the expertise experience and also the newer concepts which are in uh, last but not the least i think uh, transforming that entire talent management strategy within an organization uh, that includes uh, skills or focuses on skills whether it's upskilling reskilling or cross skilling is something that will help people to move forward uh, in today's changing world these are my take wonderful uh, thank you so much uh, sujata and rajiv for that really enriching and insightful discussion i think it's a great start to season 2 of the knowledge show very befitting and thank you both for uh, your time uh, for this show uh, but we will not close the show before we have another quick quick uh, fun segment and it's called a two lies and a truth right uh, so based on your first impression of your uh, of each other you guys have to do some uh, drill here right so uh, rajiv i'll give you three statements about sujata and you have to identify which one of them is true right so sujata the first statement is sujata has sold several of her paintings in public auctions second she has a passion for photography third sujata gave her first public music concert performance at the age of 11 which one of this is true about sujata um i think it is uh, option c she gave her uh, first public uh, performance at the age of 11 oh no 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 that's not the right one oh my god okay <laughs> so uh, making it up for partly true uh, she gave her first public music concert performance at the age of 7 it was a bit tricky and uh, <laughs> 
Wow. <laughs> At least I was in the zone because she has a beautiful voice. So I had to, uh, I had to guess. <laughs> right. Uh, I had intentionally put that to confuse you anyway. <laughs> but, but the right answer is she has a passion for photography. Okay. Awesome. And with regards to the first statement that she has sold several of her paintings in public auctions, while she is pretty much into paintings, she has never sold it, but given them away. Multi-talented is a keyword here. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So, Jata, the next uh, and the final question is for you. Uh, which of these statements about Rajiv is true? The first statement is Rajiv has co-authored a book called Transformational Apprenticeship in Banking. Second statement is Rajiv has delivered a TEDx session on the topic Pursuit of Passion. Or third. Rajiv founded a media entertainment company called Cool Pixie Entertainment in 2001. Which one of these statements is true about Rajiv? I think B because I have heard him speak and that's why I'm taking this chance. You've made it very tough for me, but I guess the second one may be true. Again, you are partly right, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I made it really difficult for both of you guys here. Rajiv has delivered a TEDx session on the topic of pursuit of happiness, not passion. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Am I right, Rajiv? Yes, yes, yes. It's a really difficult uh, question to figure out. Right, and and you need very good memory also. Or, or in in terms of the first statement, Rajiv has co-authored a book called Transformational Leadership in Banking and Not Apprenticeship in Banking. So the correct. A correct statement was Rajiv did uh, found a media entertainment company called Cool Pixie Entertainment in two thousand and one. Oh, director as well. That's great. Congratulations on that. And uh, thank you. Two, two really, really multi talented personalities. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's wonderful to have met uh, Rajiv also and have a lovely conversation. I truly enjoyed this uh, time. I don't even know whether we always shot the time, but <laughs> I really enjoyed the time, and it was an honor being here. So thank you so much. Likewise, for I, I'll do a plus one on that. Uh, really enjoyed this time. Um, awesome interacting with you and learning from you, Sujata. So thanks for taking this time. Absolutely. Yeah, we did overshot a little bit, but with the kind of insights and the discussion that was happening, I didn't really uh, want to stop that. I myself personally was learning so much, and I'm sure all of our learners and and viewers would find it really enriching and uh, exciting. So great way to kick off uh, the first episode of season two of the Knowledge Show. Thank you so much, Sujata and Rajiv, and for all our viewers, we'll uh, see you next time at uh, the Knowledge Show powered by Nolski. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.